So, then <laughs> welcome to my talk. <clears throat> I'm Raul Grieben, I'm a PhD student here at the Institute. And today I'm going to present <clears throat> a neurodynamic process model of scene representation, guided visual search and scene grammar in natural scenes, and also how to bridge DFT and deep neural networks. So I'm sure that everyone here probably knows what a deep convolutional neural network is. But just as a short reminder, oops, sorry, I have to change something here. Uh, that uh, convolutional neural networks are deep neural networks that use at least one or more from these uh, convolutional neur <coughs> convolutional layers. And usually, uh, one of these CNNs consists of a so called feature extraction network and a classifier network on top. And modern CNNs are trained end to end using backpropagation. A pre trained so called headless CNN can be used as a pure feed, for <coughs> feed forward feature extractor without the classification networks, so that the output of the last layer can be used as the complex feature maps for the given input image. Okay, what dynamic field theory is, I think. Uh, now everyone knows, uh, and probably also everyone knows that one can build dynamic field architectures to realize cognitive processes and motor behavior. And as these the networks are defined by the directional coupling bit among the fields, Oops. Uh, <clears throat> and eventually to sensory motor interface and that autonomous sequences of processing steps emerge from the underlying dynamic instabilities of the dynamic neural fields. So on the one hand, we have these deep neural networks <coughs> that are able to extract the complex features needed for object recognition. That's quite similar to what the ventral stream of human vision does. And on the other hand, we have dynamic field theory that delivers the neural process needed for higher cognition like some you have probably heard before are autonomous process organization, sequence generation, feature binding, working memory, among others. So an interface between them would combine the theoretical strengths of the two frameworks and allowing for complex cognitive operations on natural visual input. And uh, for this interface, we propose that uh, mapping <coughs> from the distributed representation of the CNN feature maps of the headless CNN can be mapped <coughs> to the localist representation of a three-dimensional neural field defined over foveal space and object identity, and that this mapping can be learned. <coughs> Uh, and for this, we propose to use the neurally plausible BCM learning rule, uh, the Beanstalk Cooper Monroe rule, because this is compatible with neural learning process that were found in the IT cortex. <coughs> so uh, we built upon prior work, prior work, in which we presented a neural process account for classical visual search experiment, like uh, classic feature versus conjunctive search and also proposed answers to long-standing questions in the field. For once, the influence of scene memory in the preview paradigm, and for the other, the relationship between attention and feature binding in the context of the unexpectedly efficient triple conjunction search. So uh, today I'm not talking about these models, but these models, of course, are the base for the model that I'm going to present. Uh, there are, uh, in the, a video on the DFT, DFT web page from the summer school in last year, so there you can see I present the, these two models. I'm also happy to answer questions per email if you have questions to the papers, so contact me at any time. So, however, these uh, previous models were limited to these classical laboratory stimuli that probably everyone in psychology knows. <coughs> And the goal was to understand the neural processes that enable the human brain to find categorically find objects in natural scenes. So it's quite easy to find the red vertical uh, rectangle, but it can be quite tedious to find, for example, the orange 
paprika, depending on the structure of the scene. <clears throat> but uh, unfortunately, there's little known on how humans guide with a search for categorically defined targets in natural scenes. It is very well studied and there's a plethora of evidences how basic feature guidance works. So for the red vertical rectangle, uh, but this plus for categorical guidance is a very hard problem. So what are the features that guides visual search for when someone says, look for the cat? So there's evidence that color is used. So if someone says, look for the red paprika, uh, you will find it quite fast if it's the only red object of a few red objects. And there is evidence that something we'll call pre-attentive shape is used. So if, you, if someone say look for the sheep, you will probably also look at something like a, a pullover that may have the colors of the shape of a sheep. But what this pre-attentive shape really is, is a completely open and unsolved question. And <clears throat> our solution uh, that we propose here is to extract these pre-attentive shapes guidance features from an intermediate layer of the CNN model and then learn the association between them and categorical concepts so that they can be used to guide visual search for categories. <clears throat> uh, in the previous model, we had something that we call basic feature matching. So the matching on the, if the basic features in the perception matches those that we expect, like if it, is the object red, is it vertical. But for natural scenes and categorical objects, you also need object recognition in the matching process. So if to check if the label uh, <coughs> uh, matches. So if I'm looking at something that is red, is it also a red paprika? So I have to recognize the paprika. And so <coughs> Our solution was to embed a headless DFCNN as the feature extraction network and then learn the mapping. So <clears throat> this is now a, a very interesting example of how humans search in natural scenes. So normally since um, laboratory scenes have been always in some kind of monocolored background, the major problem in natural scenes is they are highly, okay, this is of course not the best example for this, but normally they are highly crowded with information. And so what people really do when they are looking in natural scenes is if there is a meaning in the scene, of course, if there's no meaningful constellation in the scene, they will always use an extensive search, but if there if they can extract the meaning from the scene from previously experienced <clears throat> encounters with this kind of scenes, they will highly reduce the search space by using a so-called anchor object and their reproducible space in relation to other objects. So this is what's called uh, scene grammar by the group of Wo. In this example, uh, the the person was asked to look for the mirror in the bathroom. And of course, anyone can see there is no mirror in the bathroom. And still, if you look at the heat map where people look, there's a strong bias to look above the sink. So Vo proposed that if a model would first look for the sink and then from experience, from previous experience, from recalling, from long time memory, that the mirror is expected to be above the sink the uh, search area to be scanned could be highly reduced to only this small area above the sink. <clears throat> so we will propose a new neural process account to account for scene grammar in our model. So these are the key ingredients that are needed to move from a model that works or that models the neural processes that are needed for visual search to extend them to also work on natural objects and scenes and categories. So this is the picture of the complete neural process model. 
this is of course the first glance of course a quite large and complex model and no one is ex expects you to understand this complete model at first glance <clears throat> but uh, i also wanted to mention that since the same model solves many different cognitive processes process at, at the same time it is also strongly constrained because each building block is, con is theoretically constrained so now i'm going to uh, zoom into different parts of the models and show what these processes are so the first process is the extracting the feed forward, feed forward <laughs> features and the salience maps from visual input so the input to the model is the retinal image um, just as a side note this model is simplified in the sense that it doesn't have a gauge shift we also have a version with gauge shift but uh, it doesn't change the uh, the model itself so the processes so to ease understanding we don't have a real gauge shift here in this model so that the four-wheel limits is only cut out at the currently attended location and um, then we have this image processing block that's the 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 single algorithmic part so here we have this um, in <coughs> an 4gg16 uh, cnn and uh, use an intermediate layer to extract the, the, the shape maps and the color is extracted uh, is by extracting the hue value <coughs> these are uh, feed as input to these uh, feature maps that are defined over retinal space and the respective feature like color and shape and <clears throat> this serves as the input to the scene spaces salience field importantly there is a uh, center surround filter as the uh, that um, works only on the feature space meaning that um, there's a, a self excitatory part and inhib local inhibition meaning that object or locations with with the same feature uh, that are near to each other uh, will inhibit um, each other uh, this is then used as a um, as a kernel <coughs> when marginalizing the activation from these fields to the scene space salience field meaning that this field here has gr a graded pattern of activation that represents how salient or how different one object is to the object surrounding them. This is very important, for example, uh, to, to extract objects from their se by segmentation from their uh, background, because the background tends to inhibit themselves because they are normally very uniform. Uh, <coughs> so it's very important to use some kind of saliency and these center surround filters are also used in the probably most dominant uh, model for bottom-up saliency the etienne koch model so uh, and they're also very highly uh, neurally plausible so that's the reason why we use them but uh, this is also a very um, simplified um, account for the bottom-up processing because it doesn't take for example the, the size uh, problem into account and this is the retinal path and then now we have the new foveal path that uh, <coughs> cuts out the a small image pad at the currently attended location and this is now uh, feed into a separate feature extraction pathway that only works on this small image pads but importantly the retinal image that uh, serves as the input for the image processing is uh, scaled down so meaning that it has a very low uh, resolution and the four-wheel limit is cut, cut from the original image meaning that it has, has a high resolution this is um, a, a <clears throat> to try to uh, simulate uh, that in the four-wheel there are more neurons so the there's a higher resolution in the four-wheel area but of course it's an, very shortcutly uh, solution this foveal image then serves as the input to a complete headless cnn and the last layer is then the feature map maps that serves as the input for 
our 3D field that goes through this vessel mapping. And how this mapping works and is learned will be explained later when we are talking about the learning. But currently keep in mind that this 3D field here defined over foveal space as an input as a third dimension label and not the feature maps. And here is also extracting the hue color so that we have a representation of the hue colors in the foveal region. Okay, so uh, this is now the part of the model that is responsible for attentional selection through bias competition and also for feature binding in the sense of N. Treisman's feature integration theory. So this is the scene space selection field that is selective, meaning that it only contains one peak at any point in time. And this is what's responsible for the account for the feature integration theory, because since there's only one peak at the selected location at any point in time, this spatial information can be used to <coughs> bind all features at this location to this location. And this receives as an <coughs> as a input the bottom-up saliency. Uh, it also has this inhibition of return that um, inhibits previously visited locations. And then we have in the top-down path a free excitatory inputs. So the first is the feature guidance inputs that gives selective advantage to um, objects that uh, have a combination of one of features that are known to be part of the from these guidance features like the guidance color and the guidance shape. And um, we, here we have the scene guidance that we will look in depth later, that's responsible uh, to give a spatial bias to the <coughs> uh, location that is um, in relation to the found anchor object. And we have this memory guidance that uh, gives um, a high input, uh, accessory input to, to objects that are known that you have previously seen during exploration, meaning that if you're looking for red paprika and you have a red paprika in your scene memory, it will be autonom <coughs> automatically selected. Then we have the match detection, and uh, this subnetwork is responsible to <coughs> compare in parallel the expected features, uh, the, <laughs> the expected features from uh, from memory and the currently attended features. So is it red, is it a paprika? And then we have a match detection that uh, checks if the extended, attended and expected features overlap. And if all features overlap, the condition of satisfaction eventually gets activated and signaling that the currently attended location, there's an object that matches the requirements that we're looking for. And then we have this neural timer and COD that will eventually get activated if the COS doesn't get activated, meaning that, that we have a cycle of inhibitory <coughs> uh, a cycle of inhibitory um, uh, deboosting of the attention field. So now we come to the learning part. Uh, where the, com <coughs> the association between the complex four-wheel features at attended location and the categorical concept for object recognition are learned. So first of all, <coughs> we have these label concept nodes that are activated currently by hand, but could also be activated by a language interface like Daniel is going to present today, I think. And then, for example, look for the red pepper, then uh, in this case, look for the pepper, there's no color currently in this part here, uh, by learning, of course, uh, so uh, this uh, <laughs> the object you're currently attending is a pepper, sorry. Uh, and so activating the pepper, this is stored in the label queue working memory, because the information is, of course, transient in nature. And we also have a transient learning boost that induces a transient uh, that is... Uh, allows for a fixed cycle of um, learning, meaning that uh, in the time that the learn node is, is 
active uh, two different learn processes get activated and oh, and uh, by this inhibitory coupling after a fixed time the node will be deactivated so it's a fixed time of i think around 50 milliseconds that the model will associate the currently attended features with the label concept node so um the two different learn processes once this um, synaptic weights here so um, this is a mapping that um, from the feature maps oh, so i wanted to zoom in uh, from the feature maps of the Hetel cnn to a space and label representation and very importantly the space information it's of course it's uh, rudimentary because uh, the CNN tends to lose spatial information but in the last layer of the CNN there's still some rudimentary spatial information and since we are only working on a small part of the of the foveal image it's um, enough uh, is maintained so meaning that the feature neurons at <coughs> only are connected to the to simplify it to this discrete neurons in this field so if you see this field as a discrete <coughs> neurons defined over space and over discrete label dimension so each of the neurons in the feature maps are only connected to all label neurons at their location so the information of space is maintained this is of course making learning harder since there's no weight sharing uh, but it also makes the highly more neurally plausible and th this of course gets the label queue information meaning that the currently given label by the supervisor will induce a slice input so that only super threshold activation at the currently given label uh, gets uh, allows for learning the association to this label Okay, the second part is the feature guidance template. So here we have this uh, two-dimensional synaptic weights that are uh, similar to the, or the equivalent to um, to a pre-shaped memory trace, like I'm pretty sure you have heard about them in the lectures. And um, this is also a shortcut for something that Jan will present today, so you could also learn the direct synaptic weights between the label concept nodes and the attended features but to simplify it uh, here we are doing a two-dimensional weight learning <coughs> that uh, is only an, an association so an auto association between the currently attended label and the currently given features that can uh, then later be read out by activating an rich on the label dimension okay and um, so the next part is the sub part of the model is the autonomous visual exploration uh, <coughs> and also building the scene memory of attended objects so um, these parts of the model we are already talked about so the only thing that is new now is these scene memory fields that receive a column input from the currently attended um, location and at the same time receive um, two the, for each field for the respective attended um, feature and slice input meaning that where the currently attended label and the current position overlap a peak forms in memory and of course there are capacity limitations the number of peaks if it's in short time memory and you could also see this as a long time memory depending on the task at hand and yeah so this is also the reason why i mentioned earlier that the peak in this field is responsible for feature binding in the sense of entriesman because now that we have this column input the features are bound over the same space that's also the reason why these scene memory fields are defined over space so that information is bound over space that when reading out 
an object, you are giving a location and not reading out the features of object XYZ. Okay. So um, this is a running simulation, of course, a video of a running simulation of the architecture. And I'm going to select, uh, to highlight selected critical moments in time. So first of all, a salient location is intentionally selected. And the object category is detected. So we see that this is a tape at the currently attended location. And then the category and the look <coughs> at the location is committed to the scene memory. So we see now that this is a 3D field, <laughs> but uh, for better visualization, it's represented as um, slices of two dimensions. But in reality, it's of course a three dimensional field. Uh, so this is the, <coughs> the feature dimension of a label, meaning that this is uh, defined over space. So this is the space where the, the tapes are. And now we see here, there's a one tape. We also see the inhibition of return inhibiting the currently attended location. And then a new salient location is intentionally selected <coughs> and it's detected that the calculator and it's also committed to memory. Now we see that at this location there's a calculator. And the process is repeated until there are no more salient locations. Of course, I'm going to stop now. <coughs> um, and the scene memory can be used to guide visual search, as I mentioned earlier, or as the basis for other cognitive operations like scene reasoning or among others. So the next cognitive operation is visual search for categorically defined target objects in natural scenes. And <clears throat> many of the components uh, I've already presented. So um, I want to highlight very and the most important parts. So first of all, by activating the label concept nodes, we have a working memory representation of the label queue. And this is written to this expected label and <clears throat> yeah. And the expected color here shouldn't be highlighted, sorry, because uh, this is only an, uh, a categorical search without color information. Now this, um, oh no, it's, it's correct. No, that's like I said, you know. Um, okay, so now we have a uh, label. This expected label serves as a rich input to these uh, previously mentioned fields, meaning that now we can extract if there's any um, stored uh, long time information about what are the guiding features for this expected label, meaning that we get a color guidance feature and a shape guidance feature. And these two now serve as the input to, as a slice input to the feature guidance field that receives us a sub threshold input to these earlier mentioned feature maps, meaning that peaks <coughs> emerge at locations where the, these um, features overlap. So here uh, there are objects that may be red and here objects that may have a pepper um, shape. And no, now we can read out um, a nonlinear mapping. Uh, uh, I think this technicality is not as interesting. So, but people that really are interested in visual search, if there are any, uh, may have a look at my Coxay paper from last year, so how this um, nonlinearity is important. But uh, for now, there is some kind of representation here. How the what's the priority of the results based only on the feature guidance. And yeah, so then let's have a look at the simulation. That's probably way more interesting. So the task here is to find a pepper. 
and we see that there is a label queue stored in rock memory for Pepper. Yes. <clears throat> but no color queue. And we have two uh, guidance features, so um, a yellow and uh, a specific shape that we can give a name. Uh, now one might ask why uh, yellow, uh, because uh, this model was only trained on one pepper, so it single shot learning, it only have seen one view of one pepper in its life, and what's a yellow pepper. So uh, here it's in memory, it's thought that the, this is the feature of pepper and that all peppers that he's know is yellow. Um, <clears throat> we also see that in the feature matching there is uh, an expected label, but there's no expected color. So the first object that matches the label will be selected as a, the candidate of the visual search. Okay, ah, sorry, I just wanted to add one thing. If you had a look at the input to the field, you will see that there's a strong input to everything that is yellowish and everything that is pepper shaped. So um, let's keep in mind how this looks because then you can compare it when we change the task. So <laughs> that was probably <laughs> very fast, but the first attended location was a yellow pepper. Uh, because it has the highest <coughs> salience in the input. Uh, this also comes because it also has the higher, by chance it also had the highest bottom-up saliency and it also matches all the features. And so now we have this attended location. And the... <coughs> yeah, now we see that the... Um, category that it recognized was pepper and that is matches the attended feature, uh, yeah, the attended and label matches and so we have a match. And the current location is then committed to the target position working memory that's not used currently but then can be used for cognitive processes that uh, work on, because visual search is also the only the uh, first front end, meaning that after you found the object, of course, you want to interact with it. So it's good to store the position in working memory so that other processes can work with this position because attention will shift away after visual search. So the next operation is visual search for target object defined by a combination of category and color. So now the difference is we're not looking for a pepper, but for a specific colored pepper, like red pepper, meaning that we <coughs> not only activate a label concept node, but also a color concept node. And so uh, now we have a, uh, an expected label and an expected color. <coughs> and the expected color will overwrite the guidance feature that was stored from memory, meaning that if in memory we have peppers are yellow, the guidance feature here is overwritten by the expected color from working memory, meaning that now the guidance is red and the shape remains the same. This also will change the feature guidance and everything else is equally, is the same as m mentioned before. So, as I mentioned earlier, the model's prior expectation is that all peppers are yellow. So here the task was to explicitly find a red pepper. Uh, to demonstrate the attentional guidance template can be flexibly modified by top-down processes. And now we see that there's also a color queue stored in working memory. And this, here we see how it overrides the guidance feature. It was previously yellow, it's now red and we see that we not only have an expected label but also an expected color in the feature matching oh and now I, as i mentioned earlier to keep in mind how the input looked because now the input is pepper and red and there's very few red information in there so that we now have a drastically different looking input so the the difference in in the working memory re queue representation has a high impact on the 
input to our attention field. So the first selected image uh, object location, uh, first selected location, is again the red pepper because it has the highest bottom-up saliency. <coughs> but now we see that the label matches with a pepper, but the color doesn't match because we are expecting red. We are seeing uh, we are expecting red. We are seeing yellow. So there's uh, no peak forms here. So a new location is attentively selected. And it turns out to be a red pepper because it's the next salient reason. <clears throat> and this time uh, both the label and the color matches. So it really is a red pepper. And the location is also committed to the target position working memory. Okay, and the last cognitive operation is the new neural process account for scene grammar. So now there are a little bit more changes. So now we not only have the label queue and the, a possible color queue, but we also have a scene type. Okay, normally the scene type would come from the gist, but we are not modeling gist recognition. <laughs> it's very complicated. So in this case, we are uh, making the simplification that the scene is given. So the task is look for the mirror in the bathroom. But normally, if you say to the persons look into the mirror and they will recognize it's a bathroom scene grammar gets automatically triggered from the gist information so but this is not part of the model <coughs> but this has a high impact on this search queue so now we have the expected label possibly an expected color but we also have the <coughs> the scene type so this is uh, the working memory representation for a uh, long time memory representation for uh, combinations of known labels, scenes, and anchors, meaning that here a peak will form if there's an overlap between the, the stored representation, the given label, and the given scene type. And if here a peak appears, then we have a known anchor that's stored into the anchor label working memory. And this serves as input to the label anchor relation field that also has a um, long time mem memory representation for uh, known relations to anchors. Uh, these both here are hand coded, they are not learned by experience because it's also something that's highly complicated and not in the model. So here these are fixed synaptic weights for because it doesn't change the process that we want to show here and here a peak immerse if an relation is a known relation exists and this relation is then stored into to anchor relation working memory we also have this termination neural node that will eventually get activated after some time meaning that um, after a fixed time no anchor was found in the scene uh, the working memory representation will get deleted, meaning that then an extensive search will occur. This prevents from getting stuck to look for the anchor if there's no anchor in the scene. And then if there's no anchor, it will have a normal visual search for the label. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have this um, anchor uh, information. And so the visual search will now um, <clears throat> overwrite uh, the label here. So the expected label gets overwritten by the anchor label, meaning that we will not look for the label itself, but look for the anchor label. This will also change the feature guidance to the anchor label. And once here an object is found in the feature matching, it will be stored in the anchor label working memory and not in the target position working memory. And this position will then be used to um, induce a spatial bias. Um, Daniel will talk, I think, more about them. They come from work from Knips and from Matthias Richter that will also talk today. And these uh, patterns uh, for spatial relations are, are also used. And they will induce a, a pattern as a prototypical peak here that will be transformed by a coordinate transformation that Sebastian Schneegans presented. And then we have um, 
uh, and this uh, prototypical peak that represents a spatial template that is centered on the position of the anchor and this will serve as a spatial bias input to the scene spatial selection field. So we will now see in the video how this works. So first of all we have this label queue here, look for the mirror. Now we see that uh, we have the scene tape bathroom and that we have a known anchor label that is uh, sync. We see now that a peak emerges at the anchor relation above. And we also see that the expectation gets overwritten. So uh, previously we had as an expectation to look for a mirror. Now the expectation is to look for a sink. Okay, so here we see that um, the change and maybe I'll go one back. So have a look at the input to the field. So this was here the currently attended look for a mirror, how the input to the field looked. And then we changed to look for an sink. Oops. Okay. Sorry, something is. Okay, now it stopped. Um, we see how the input to the field changes, so there's no strong bias to the location where the sink really is. and it gets selected and uh, then recognizes that it really is a sync. So there's a matching and the position is written in the mentioned anchor position working memory. And now the expectation switches back to mirror. So the anchor label was reset in working memory and we see how the spatial template emerges uh, centered at that location. And then uh, a location above the sink is uh, attentionally selected, but no mirror is found there. Okay, so we have shown a neural process account of visual search and scene memory that autonomously builds a scene representation and performs guided categorical visual search and natural scenes. And we found solutions for three important problems. How the association between a categorical concept and pre-attentive shape can be learned from the intermediate layer of a CNN. How the distributed representation of the CNN feature map can be mapped to the localist representation of a dynamic neural field. And how scene grammar emerges from the underlying neural dynamics. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have.